meeting tonight. Uh, I think it'll be a relatively short meeting, uh, but just sticking with the agenda at hand. Um, I put down the approval of the minutes. Um, I do have minutes for April 25th and May 18th meetings. Uh, the only minor detail is I've never actually sent them to anybody for review. Um, so I'm going to defer that until the next meeting. Okay. Um, so no minutes tonight for approval, but they will be on the next agenda. Okay. And then affordable housing update. Um, Bill, you were uh, planning board had uh, some audience uh, about 40R. Yes. So we had, um, and I'll just repeat for the recording here, we uh, met with uh, Bill Ray, who is the principal planner of smart growth programs at the executive office of housing and living and livable communities. And we talked with him about uh, 40R zoning. And his office is what we would go through to get a 40R zoning district um, approved. And um, Chardot, and we went through what a 40R was at the last meeting um, very briefly, but just for an overview, it's um, it's basically a state affordable uh, state program for uh, creating districts with special rules. So you can have multiple family dwellings. Uh, you can have affordable. Uh, you basically tweak the zoning, fine tune the zoning to allow. Uh, um, different styles of dwellings in different locations. Um, we initially were exploring it as an alternative to um, the, with the ZBA's denial of the application for the Econolodge conversion of whether creating a 40 r district would be another way to um, uh, achieve the same goal. Uh, we did learn that it is not that easy because the, the state regulations create a disincentive for creating a 40R district to accommodate a rejected 40B comprehensive permit. But we could um, enlarge the district to be more than just one site, um, and that would cure the problem. Um, so we're we're thinking of maybe if we're going to do it, we're going to do it on a larger scale and not just try to um, not just try to create an ad hoc response to the uh, Econolodge situation. And Bill, um, is that? Because they're trying to make sure that they um, dissuade, you know, spot zoning effectively, or uh, not so much that they want to encourage additional construction, and uh, they actually want to uh, favor non-subsidized construction to get more construction in there that if something can only go through with the subsidy um, that is of some benefit, but not as much as they would, as they would like to achieve. Mm -hmm. So um, what it does is create some options and, and I'm going to anticipate because I have talked with Shardul before that um, at present um, the only exception to the rule of uh, one dwelling per lot would be senior housing and certain other minor exceptions, converting dwellings to multifamily, doing accessory apartments, but those are, are small scale. Um, whereas under 40R, we could um, basically create a, a district that would accommodate a larger, a larger 
you know, an apartment house or townhouses um, with a requirement that a portion of them be affordable. And if it was a rental model, as long as 25% was affordable, 100% of the units, the 75% market rate units would count towards the affordable housing inventory. Um, so it's promising on, on several levels. It, it, it's basically a, a variation on what uh, Winfield accomplished through a 40B comprehensive permit but it gives us more control because we get to say where we would like to have it and not just where the developer wants to put it. Mm -hmm. So um, that potentially could deal with several issues that Shardul might be dealing with on, on your project based on our prior conversations. You may have evolved beyond that. So if anybody wants to take a look at it, uh, the uh, it, it's on the uh, Happy Media uh, Facebook and YouTube pages. Um, and the conversation with the guy from the state uh, comes in at 45 minutes into it, and it pretty much takes up the rest of the meeting. Isn't there um, also like a financial incentive for the town? With 40R, yes. You do right. get a financial incentive for creating the district, and you get further benefits for every affordable unit you bring into the district. So um, we haven't really quantified what that means. <clears throat> it also, interestingly... Um, can be adopted by a simple majority of town meetings does not require a two thirds majority. So, uh, and that that's a big change. That's a big change. It's only for uh, basically affordable housing issues. We still have to go to town meeting, mm -hmm. and a forty R district. We have to. We basically have to do all the work, create the district, develop the bylaw then send it into Boston for review and approval before we can take it to town meeting. Mm -hmm. And then it has to go back to uh, uh, this livable, I have to get used to the phrase, Executive Office of Housing and Liv Livable Communities for final approval before. So this is not a quick Fix. This is something that with the amount of effort required to create everything and get pre-approvals, if we're looking at Springtown meeting 2024, that would be rosy. And did you get a sense from your fellow planning board members? Is there an appetite to, to look at this? Or? Yes, I definitely think we want to look at it some more. Mm -hmm. um, there may be some grant money out there for getting um, consultants to help craft it. Um, we may be able to accomplish some of the same results through PVPC and our existing contract there. But um, they had a uh, they had recently hired a person to be a housing planning specialist, and she lasted about three months, yeah. and is gone. So, um, so that's an area they're interested in, but um, um, I'm not sure if they'll how much how effective they would be able to be in helping us. So, um, uh, Bill promised he would uh, send us some um, some information, uh, some of the regulations, and uh, at least. Uh, the names of something arbitrary, like the consultants who participate. He, he can't recommend anyone, but he can give us the, the, the consultants who handled the last 10 application, successful applications. Okay. So um, it's, it's progress. It, we, we know a lot more about it than we did three months ago. Uh, but again, it's not going to be a short, it's a, it's a, a 
long-term solution, a long-term project and not a short-term solution. Right. No, but that, that's good though, given, you know, again, going back to the, the current inventory, uh, you know, the expectation um, of our affordability you know, measure or whatever we want to call it um, with the new census data coming out mm -hmm. well overdue at this point. They're about a month behind pushing those numbers out, but the expectation is we're definitely moving closer to that 10%. We're not going in the other direction. Um, and then we know we're going to have inventory dropping off a um, few years down the road. So, okay. Well, so I encourage everybody to go back and watch the Tuesday planning board meeting about 45 minutes in and see what they have to say. Okay. Um, so next on the agenda, we have a potential development projects. So nothing new with uh, Trinitas, um, no update from their council on that front, uh, other than what I reported last time, which sounded like they were kind of regrouping. Um, but Shardul Palmer is with us tonight, and he did want to have audience with us to talk about uh, projects that the Palmer family is working on. Yeah, and uh, kind of echoing what uh, Bill had um, mentioned about, you know, um, kind of looking at it in the 40B, 40R realm of, of, of the project. And especially with the 25% um, affordability requirement, what we're looking to do is is over 55 apartments. Uh, they would would they would be two bedroom apartments, about a thousand square feet each, and um, and essentially it's the 41 Russell Street, which is the village village barn shops. Um, we have. Go We've done obviously some development on the on the property with Manny's and Hadley Farms, but most of the buildings are um, quite old and not really marketable, and it's already a challenging environment with with rental uh, rental market right now. And so, one of the the best options for us and, and to, to get the the density and the, and the activity that we need is over fifty five. Uh, uh, housing, which it would, which would be apartments, and ideally we're, we're looking at something like fifty six apartments, um, uh, be a three story building. I think my brother presented a um, a, a plan of of kind of what we were looking at. I have a I have a PowerPoint up. I don't know if I can share my screen or not, but um, sure, if you could, because we. Um... Okay. Oh, actually, that's for you to do, Bill, right? Yeah, all set. <laughs> all right. Okay. Uh, let's see. Is it up? Something's coming. Okay. So we, we would build the building, as I'm assuming everybody can see it. Um, and so we would build the building, um, kind of an L-shaped building next to the village barn shops. Um, what we'd like to do, uh, you know, understanding going, kind of going back to what Bill was talking about with the 40B, 40R, is kind of have a more flexible zoning and, and, and bylaw requirement in terms of the building footprint. We are in the, I think it's the village overlay district, so we are limited in terms of footprint and height um we're still going to be in the height requirement we'd still we would still meet it but we would probably look for a larger footprint of a building and what we'd also like to do is Hadley Farms which we owned and, and operate we're, we're not operating anymore we would like to go and combine the new building with Hadley Farms so that we can create use utilize the existing space for accessory uh, amenities such as a fitness center, um, possibly a function room, um, and other other thing activity rooms, so that um, for the residents of the of the facility, essentially storage, those types of things that we, we would go and re reconfigure Hadley Farms to go and um, accommodate those amenities, uh, but 
again having kind of a one one cohesive built one building but um it would probably be architecturally it would be different in, in the sense that it would be there would be different architecture between the two buildings but they would be connected so that you could freely go in and out of the both buildings without going outside um so that's kind of what um our plan is um the building it's probably going to be uh, all together probably a 20,000 square foot footprint probably three floors 60,000 square feet again th these are definitely larger than what's currently allowed by um the, the bylaws and the zoning. Um, the other aspect that we are um, requesting, we would be creating about 14 new affordable uh, units. And I don't know how much you guys know about uh, affordability and, and how the, uh, kind of the rental rates that are um, determined, but Hadley is, is part of this uh, Springfield census track. So uh, even though rental rates in Hadley and Hampshire County are different than what they are in Springfield, we're limited by what we can charge based on based on the Springfield um, rates. And so um, one of the things that we would probably be requesting, and, and I just saw an article very recently about this, is utilizing um, CPA money to go and subsidize those uh, 14 units. So we'd be looking for roughly $50,000 each for each unit to, to go and subsidize the cost of construction, uh, constructing those units. Um, so this is kind of the, the, the breakdown, 56 two bedroom apartments, 14 affordable units. Um, they would be at the 80% average median income. Uh, requesting that the footprint be increased, again, the CPA funds. And, and again, having a flexible uh, bylaw requirement uh, so that we can go and kind of build what's really marketable and what's um, to get the highest amount of density uh, on the facility. Because it's, it's, a, it's a large site, we have a lot of old buildings, but uh, we know that the, the demand is there and that we can put uh, such a large building in our property and it would really not negatively impact kind of the open space that's currently there because we're probably going to be and um, with the building and the green green things that we're going to be doing we're probably going to be creating um a, a space that looks less barren i guess than what what's currently there because it's a big open parking lot this would uh, again beautify uh, the area even more than it is so um, our future plans is are to is demolish the the again all the existing older buildings. Uh, most of the buildings were built in the late seventies, early eighties, and again, they're just they're just very difficult and and not really marketable to to what the needs are today for for most tenants and for really any other uses. I know it's a lot, <laughs> so I know I, I've uh, I, I've kind of uh, this is kind of our I, ideal situ um, requirement, but uh, we're more than happy to go and 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 talk and discuss the options that we have. I don't know. Um, again, I reviewed this as a as like kind of a friendly forty B or possibly a forty R, um, but you know, one of the things that uh, um, that was pointed out is the the uncertainty about 40R and the and the kind of the time that's going to take to go and have that happen. While ideally we'd like to start something like this, go into a planning board and do all these things this year, and hopefully start construction in uh, spring summer of next year. So so those are kind of um, our thoughts on this. But uh, again. Uh, we wanted to uh, come here and, and show what we're thinking and just to get the feedback of, of, the, of the committee. I think it might be more doable under uh, 40R, but not on that timetable. <laughs> I know. I, I agree with you. It's, um, the timetable is what's concerning. Now, as to uh, friendly 40B, uh, 
obviously we have had uh, mixed results. Well, I shouldn't say mixed results. We've had negative results. And that was a project that had the full support of the planning board and the select board. Um, so, yeah, I think those are the only two ways that this can be done. Even though senior housing is allowed in the district, it, uh, a structure that big for senior housing is not allowed. So, um, so yeah, I think you 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 correctly identified your paths your your paths forward. Yeah, we've put a lot of thought into this, and 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 just and had a lot of discussions with quite a and obviously with um, asking the questions with with Molly and yourself answering those you know getting giving us guidance guidance. But um, I, I think, as Molly pointed out, with with the upcoming, we're we're getting very close. You know, as a Hadley resident, we're we're getting very close to that threshold, and and we kind of um, the state is also from everything I've read is is very kind of scrutinizing how towns are are kind of looking at increasing affordable housing, and and. I'll be honest that the cost difference is especially, you know, we're, I would say we're probably more negatively affected in, in where we are, but just because the, 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 we are looped in with Springfield and that really impacts um, what the affordability rates that you can charge. So mm -hmm. I think going forward, even if we do some of this stuff, I think it, it's still going to be kind of, kind of a challenge uh, without get, as you mentioned before about getting a subsidy, because, you know, we're, we're going at this without really not looking for state sub subsidies or credits or anything like that. We're really, we would probably just rely on our own investment and CPA funds, which again, it definitely helps uh, with kind of absorbing the, the, the cost of those units and the the reduction in rent co compared to what we could get. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the things I like about the project, um, number one, you know, location um, in terms of accessibility to the bus line, which, um, you know, there's a bus stop right on the other side of the, the Hampton Inn there, right? Well, we have two bus stops. There's one on right. Bay Road, and then there's one right on Route 9. Yep. So you've got the Route 9, the B43 line, and then you've got the one that can take you into to South Hadley down that way. Um, and also the fact that, you know, we're, as you pointed out, Shore Duel, we're, we're repurposing an existing blacktop effectively, you know, so we're not taking away any green space. And if anything, it looks like, you know, there's opportunity to, to you know, create a little bit more um, compared to what you have today. Definitely, and and for us, it's a to doing getting into this. It's a it's a easier transition for us, uh, especially being kind of in the property management business already, in, in, with the hotel and the other tenants that we have over there. And so it's it's a it's a good and easy uh, fit for us uh, in terms of our transitioning into something like that, um, or adding adding to our portfolio. Um, so, uh, yeah, for, for us, I think it's going to be pretty easy to manage you know, for overall, just because we are already doing it and to, to maintain and to manage and, and to do all the things that needed to be done to be successful and not be blight. And, and so you know, all of those things, we're, we're kind of already set up to, to make sure that, that everything happens as, as needed. Yeah, I mean, I guess I, I would say. You know, I'm in support of the project and the location that it's in and density is obviously something we need to talk about more of. Um, I do think, you know, in the future, we should consider uh, more than 55 plus communities, although I understand the need. Uh, I guess the question maybe for you, Bill, is uh, do, are there any other avenues like writing an overlay district into our zoning code that might take less time or be, uh, you know, have, have less sort of hurdles that we have to cross in order to get it completed? There probably are simpler strategies, but whether they uh, would be successful or not, so we could create a uh, an apartment house overlay district within the village center overlay district. Um, 
but um, I would. It, it gets it skirts pretty close to spot zoning, and um, I don't know is there is. I don't know how much support there is for that uh, for general housing. I think uh, senior housing is an easier sell. <clears throat> And we do have the, uh, it, there may be a way to amend, it might be easier in, in a sense to amend the senior housing overlay district to allow larger structures. Um, but um, yeah, that, that's something that we haven't really talked about. And I don't know what kind of a reaction that would get. Is this maybe uh, something we could re weave into the conversation we talked about at one of our last meetings where we discussed having a forum, you know, talking to members of the public, you know, I mean, this particular question about, you know, housing and housing density. I know there's a lot of inherent opposition in town, but there's also tremendous need both in town and the region. So it, I think a lot of people understand that. So it, maybe it's a question of, of putting people's minds at ease and kind of erasing the NIMBY mentality. Possibly. That is an area of town where you'd like to think there isn't going to be a lot of neighborhood opposition because it is a commercial, by and large, a commercial district. Um, yeah, And yet we saw a lot of opposition to the Econolodge conversion um, from people who live nowhere near it so it, it's more than a more than the classic nimby it's sort of not in my town, town. <laughs> um, right i think part of what i or and i deal with this in jurisdictions across the country but part of what i'm wondering is if if we need to just have a you know a session where we can clarify what affordable means you know it's affordable uppercase a and affordable lowercase a um and i think you know, I've, I've started using the term workforce as a different way of describing it, but the idea mm -hmm. is that it's, you know, people have this understanding or this impression that affordable means, you know, Section 8 subsidized housing or, or something like that, which, you know, has connotations that are probably not fair, but do change people's opinions. And I think maybe building support starts with educating our, our residents about, you know, what this actually means, you know, what affordable actually means. You know, I think you're absolutely right. And it's also educating a subset of our residents who will take themselves out to town meeting when it comes up. And that can be the, uh, it's not that it can't be done, but um, there are some people who come religiously to town meeting who open the, uh, warrant that they pick up at the table and back for the first time that night to find out what's going on. That's very true. How uh, to get people to participate in local government has always been a huge issue. Yeah. yeah. So I don't um, want to discourage in any way. Um, I think um, probably the route that I would see is, is getting some much more detailed plans pulled together so that it could be used as an example of why we want to do what we're proposing to do. Right, um, kind, of, kind of a proof of concept of the idea of having more dense housing along the Route 9 corridor. Uh, you know, this is just one, one idea, one existing site. Yeah, and that's why I was thinking that going in with the senior housing would be an easier sell. And then you could say, well, look, we have 55 units of senior housing here. We have 50 units of uh, affordable housing at the uh, Econo Lodge, um, 50 units of, or 25 units of workforce housing in some other location uh, won't be a problem at all. Um, you know, that's that's why I'd like to see the Econo Lodge get up up and running so that 
this fear of an apartment building can be put to rest. To some extent, Winfield is an apartment building. If you've ever gone back there, sure. um, you don't think of it because it's truly out of sight, out of mind. Um, I know police and fire get in there from time to time, especially at the senior housing back there. But um, it it hasn't been the boogeyman that people think of, but nevertheless, it hasn't also converted into a well. That's nice. Let's let's do another nice one like that. So um, again, I I think you're on the right track for going starting with senior. Um, I think that'll be an easier sell um, and go from there. And meanwhile, we can be working on parallel tracks with 40 R's, um, maybe some um, duplexes by right, um, uh, at least in certain neighborhoods, maybe in overlay districts. And that's again, where a 40 R comes in right now, probably about, half three quarters of the town is zoned agricultural residential but that means uh people who are on uh 20,000 25,000 square foot lots and people who are on two acre five acre 10 acre lots so um you know 40r may be a tool to do some uh, with without changing the underlying zoning creating some flexibility that we don't currently have built in. And Crystal, did you have any um, reaction to the project? Well, I just was basically wondering what I was thinking about what the, the income level would be. However, um, Bill and, and Justin have confirmed and, and actually provided more insight on the, you know, the, the income range and, and as Justin said, people need to be educated of really what low income or, you know, middle income would, would really mean. And a lot of people assume the worst when it comes to um, affordable housing. You know, they assume that people who are homeless or um, of a different walk of life can't afford uh, decent housing, but these days, you know, it, it's really hard for someone to actually afford to have a decent place to live with, without going into debt and being able to afford all of the amenities that come with living in a decent housing. So I just, I just enjoy hearing all of the feedback from, you know, this project and I mean, when you look at Golden Court, those those apartments are so small, and it's it's really sad because I look at the elderly as they've lived their life. You never know what someone experienced or have done in their life, and to live out their final days in something as small as that, but it's the only thing that they can afford. And in Winfield, it does go according to your income. However, the income range is pretty high for the elderly to be able to afford. So normally when people move into there, they do not move out because they can't afford anywhere else and they're barely making a minimum to, to live there. So I'm just looking forward to see where this project goes. Yeah, I mean, so it sounds like Shardul, you know, um, you've got our support to continue to, to pursue this and we, you know, happy to be helpful in whatever way we, we can. Yeah. I, I think for us, um, it, 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 fit, it fits in, I think, as Bill pointed out with kind of the, kind of what the sentiment of the town is, it's acceptable, I guess, right now. Um, mm -hmm. Another, other aspect of it and Crystal pointed out is that there's, there's quite a few of, of over 55 people in the area that um, they, for whatever reason, the, the how having a house is not um, is it's not sustainable for them, and that and, and right now the, their value of their house is 
quite high, as we know, with the, with the how even you know Hadley and Amherst and Northampton housing values are, are are very high. So they're able to go and have all this built up equity, but they still want to stay in the community, and they really don't have any option to downsize to um, right now. And, and something like this, whether it's affordable or not affordable, there is no op. I, I did my research, but prior to this, of over fifty five uh, apartments in in our area, and there isn't one. There's you can't you can't find you know, let alone just regular apartment, um, an over fifty five apartment. That's that's almost that's not it's unheard of. I have I am, um, and I haven't seen one come up um for a while but i haven't checked recently but it is something that's r- really uh, a product that isn't in in our in our market in what whatsoever and and so it, it's is as justin pointed out it's all part of the housing system that we have it's like we the a person that's over 55 gets out of a house now that gets into the inventory and somebody else can afford to somebody else can can with a family can go live there and 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 hopefully that will be their home for for quite a few but we don't right now our system is kind of debt um gridlocked because we don't have these avenues for people to that that can't sustain housing to go into something that is more more sustainable for them physically or financially so it was interesting when we first started uh exploring the senior housing overlay district which is probably at least 10 years ago, probably closer to 15, we had, um, I want to say, three developers who were interested in um, at least three that I can remember that were in, uh, interested in uh, not only senior housing, but rental model senior housing. And um, as we evolved the bylaw, um they hit market changes uh and we never heard from them again they did not come back after we generated the bylaw and the only senior project we've had is the one that uh, Barry Roberts put in on East Street and i think it was a disappointment in the minds of some people who even supported senior housing because um as as it came in, I think people had a vision of senior housing as Golden Court and something newer, a super Golden Court was sort of the concept of this must this would be senior housing, Golden Court on on steroids, if you will. But um, as Barry was doing his market research, um he started out with relatively modest first of all he decided to do it as a condo model so it'd be sales rather than rental and secondly he started out relatively modest and you know two bedrooms one car garage no basement and um his focus groups gave a lot of feedback on we want more we want more and um Honestly, the price is, it is senior housing, but it is not affordable, <laughs> capital A or, or small A. Um, those are fairly expensive condos that are age restricted. Um, so I definitely would like to see more options out there. Um, and also in Barry's case, we we did negotiate with him a payment in lieu of uh, creating affordable units on site. So he's making payments into the affordable housing trust fund um, as his way of meeting the affordable housing need. Um, We only had one other subdivision that triggered our inclusionary zoning since we adopted it about another, about 10 years ago, and uh, they contributed to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund as well. Um, So that's another route, by the way, we do have money in the Affordable Housing Trust Fund that can supplement what um, CPA can do. 
Is that not CP? That's not the same as C. I was. I didn't understand if that was the same. No, it's a it's a different entity. We and actually the Affordable Housing Trust Fund actually got money from CPAs, affordable housing set aside, and added to it the money we received from Barry Roberts and uh -huh. from Colony uh, Colony Drive. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's over, over six hundred thousand dollars right now, Bill. Right? Or, or it will be when it when we get full pay in from. Um, from Barry Roberts. Mm -hmm. He's phasing it based on when he sells units in there. Yeah, I, th I think for us, um, you know, access to the, to those of uh, to the resources would be, uh, again, extremely beneficial to this, uh, at least the financial viability of, of, you know, it, of the project, because it does, uh, as we all know, you know, the construction costs of what those units uh, per square foot and and you know, what we're requesting is marginal <laughs> in terms of it, it's nominal compared to what what the actual cost is. So it, it, it's something that we we we're cognizant of. But um, you know, for for us, uh, my my brother and I and our family, you know, we're we're here long term. So we're not we we don't want to go. We're not interested in a in a selling selling model we're interested in more of we're developers we hold and buy and and, and continue to own for quite a while so and, mm -hmm. and so that's why um, we thought the rental model and then accessing whether it's cpa funds or from the trust fund um that would that would be i guess our request i think for you know, for us to go and continue, you know, pursue this, uh, the question is, is that, you know, I feel like the planning board, uh, I know there's going to be probably some concerns, especially with the size of the building and, and, and so on and so forth. But um, I, guess, I guess nobody can really probably answer this question is, is, is that, you know, moving forward is, is this, it is different than it, it is quite different than the Econo Lodge because you're talking about a new construction, um, a, a very different model and location than what what they did. So I, I feel like we we're different enough in there that it justifies going forward. But uh, again, there's that risk uh, with the, the kind of the precedent that's been set. And I guess the con my my question is 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 that is that does that seem reasonable or is that is that something that's probably um uh or are we going to be kind of have the similar fate to what happened before um <laughs> that's it, a crystal ball I, mean, I know <laughs> it's hard i know it's hard for you to answer it's just your project's uh, different your project yeah. is different it's over 55 it's a different location um, the developer is a known commodity um, in your local residents, your local business owners. Um, I'm thinking about, I mean, and, and again, there are objections that came up about the Econo Lodge that could, could certainly overlay um, what you're doing. But the, the other thing I would say, and I, I want to go back to Justin's point, and it's, and it's still on the agenda. I, I'm still a big proponent of starting the conversation with a wider audience in whatever way we can, because, you know, as Bill said, there was an awful lot of opposition to the Econolodge project. But when you look at the opposition relative to the entire population, voting population of the town of Hadley, it was significantly small. Um, and there were other voices who, who weren't heard in that process, um, who would be, you know, quite on the opposite end of it. So I, I think there's actually a fair amount of support for this type of project um, that you might find as well. It's just figuring out a way to, to get those voices out um, because that, that didn't happen equally um, with what happened with the Econo Lodge. And, and in terms of um, flexibility and footprint and, and all of those planning board things, I guess, is that, are, are we what, are, are we too far away from what's kind of uh, the bylaws are, or are, are we, 
kind so, of. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm, I remind me, what is it? 12, five, uh, 12,500. Yeah. Okay. So there was a reason for doing the village center overlay the way it was done. Um, and um, we did want to manage the scale. Um, so the hotel you have on that parcel is maxed out, basically. That is the biggest structure that you can currently put in the village center overlay. So building one twice that size, yeah, that might be that might be a problem. Um, I'm, um, I'm, I'm not sure that, because I, I, I don't happen to know how big Winfields is. But the few times I've been in there, it looks pretty big, um, but it's set back. It's not uh, right on the road. So yeah, that, that might be a, uh, that might be a sticking point, obviously. Um, and, and we're we we we're thinking of doing an L-shaped building to kind of not have that um, visual impact, as as in, mm -hmm. as as you as you noted, uh, and that's how we're kind of uh, you know mitigating some of those issues uh, with it because it's it's almost two different buildings, but it obviously it's going to have um, be connected uh, with 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 it with between each um between the buildings really yeah you have to put the elevator you don't want to put in two sets of elevators right and and that's and that's the thing is that we, in two sets of elevators two sets of fire alarm systems and everything else that's uh for it's just a, a lot of wasted uh you know resources for really um for one building uh, effectively a one building but it, it just right now for us, it, it's just a matter of, of getting that density that 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 we need for the number of units and and obviously the the cost of doing the the entire project and, and all those other other things to get that one building done. It's just, we're trying to spread them out as much as we can, and then um, and also incorporate it with Hadley Farms that that building and, and to reuse reuse quite a bit of that space so that we can because because that's a and it's been a challenge to go and try to find a an alternative use for that um right now in the and so we'd love to be able to go and use a very nice building to to go uh to for a use that um i think it makes a lot of sense but um so uh, yeah i i think we'll we will def definitely continue to pursue this and um and I think probably a planning board conversation is probably in order to at least get some get some thoughts and ideas um, to move forward. And you might want to just um, even just having relatively quick conversations with um, public safety. So Scott at DPW uh, and the two chiefs, it's always helpful to anticipate what they're going to say, because oftentimes those questions come up along the way as well. Sure, definitely. All right. Well, thanks, Shardul. Thanks for taking the time with us. No, thank you, guys. Thank you for your insight. Okay. And you're more than welcome to, to stay. Early. <laughs> Molly's, Molly's going to wrap the meeting up in the next minute. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, have a good night. Okay. Bye, Shardul. Yeah. yeah. So the next item on the agenda is um, possible information session on housing and zoning. Um, yeah. Again, I don't, I don't think the small group of us need to to try to resolve anything tonight, but I, I still would like to keep that alive for exactly the reason that, that Justin brought up. Um, even since our last meeting, you know, I had a couple of conversations with people who really, they were asking, you know, about zoning and Route 9 and they read something in the paper and why, why didn't Hadley do this? And, and I, you know, I don't, I don't know the magic way to make that happen. Um, but, you know, I think last time we were talking about doing something similar to, um, you know, what, you know, I had done with, in collaboration with a bunch of different people in town, um, when we put out this kind of government one-on-one -on -one programming, 
um, during the pandemic just to help people understand how the, the government works. And it, you know, that was via Zoom, uh, wasn't widely attended, but more people came honestly than I thought would um, in large part because we didn't do a whole lot of advertising. It wasn't town sanctioned, it was just done privately. And I, and I think if um, our committee could promote something like that um, with the back, you know, backing from the planning board for sure, um, and the select board, I think it's something that we could we can pull off. Um, maybe a series of of evenings. Yeah. If you're looking at doing outreach, um, <clears throat> Jim Maximoski chaired the uh, committee that worked on the affordable on the uh, housing production plan. Yep. And they did an outreach, at least one outreach session uh, that was orchestrated through Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. So. Mm -hmm. Um, we might want to loop Jim in because he has the more recent experience on how that worked out. I don't know how the, I know there was a questionnaire that went out and I don't know exactly what kind of a public forum they put on. Um, but, um, it has yeah. been done recently. Yeah, I, I was on that, um, on the committee. So I was at the forum and everything and the, the, the survey was actually, you know, very well responded to. Um, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission was surprised at, you know, and again, we're talking hundreds of responses, but still for that type of a survey, oftentimes, you know, you might get 100 to 150, you know, and, and we, we more than, um, or we doubled that. So, uh, and then the forum, like many things in the hybrid world that we live in, you know, we were still in that period where a lot of people weren't going out. So the forum physically, um, there were, you know, I don't know, maybe a dozen people there or something like that. But then the number of hits that it got of people viewing it was significantly higher. And, and I think now, you know, people are much more used to going out. And, um, you know, if we could get the word out, I think this is a topic that resonates with a lot of people who may not have participated in go in local government in any way before, but it's something that's really important to them because it might be touching a family member or, um, you know, they just want to be part of the solution, knowing that, that housing is such a huge crisis right now worldwide, so. Yeah, I think something too worth talking about, and this is probably not our purview, but maybe you could talk about it with the select board is how, how we actually notify people of, of meetings in general. I mean, I know we have the calendar on the website, but I'm guilty of having missed some because I just forgot to look that week and see what was, what was on. And most of the time, you know, the meetings get posted a few days before three days before whatever it's, the requirement is. So, you know, if I check it on a Monday and there's a meeting on a Thursday, I might not see the notification. So I don't know if there's a simple technology solution to that, but participation would probably increase if we had a, a better system for automatically notifying residents when a new meeting is on the calendar. Oh, definitely. Um, yeah, that's one of the goals for the, the town administrator for the year is helping um, kind of think through that and, and come up with some ideas to, again, push notifications to people. Um, I completely agree with you. I think we fail miserably on that front. <laughs> um, but again, something like this, you know, we can get to, the, to all of the existing committees. But I think the big thing is figuring out what the content would be, right? Because um, we don't want to, quote unquote, lead the witness. We want it to be facts based. And I'm, I'm even wondering if Pat Pioneer Valley Planning Commission could, could help us with something like this, too. Yeah, I was going to suggest that because I think, you know, in terms of data, you know, statistics for the region, they could definitely help point to you know, demographic shifts and trends. I mean, a lot of that information is in the um, master plan or housing production plan, whatever document they helped produce. Uh, so they'd be a great voice. And I, I was wondering too, on the um, the outreach front, maybe it was the, uh, the town meeting 101 or, or town government 101 thing, but uh, I do remember getting a survey or a mailer in the mail that linked to a survey online. And I filled out the survey online at one point and it was questions about like, you know, what kind of housing would you like to see more of? What kind of housing would you not like to see more of? That sort of thing. Uh, it might be worth trying to figure out how to do that. And then maybe we can also have a field for, you know, 
do you have a question? Like, what would your question be? And then we can gather all those questions as responses and then answer the questions rather than having kind of an open, um, you know, anybody can get up and ask a question kind of meeting. We could have all the questions submitted beforehand and then select the 10 questions that are the most applicable and answer those directly. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a good idea. Yeah, Bill, how do you, um, I mean, if we would really have to have the planning board behind this, right? Because this is, well, I mean, we don't have to have the planning board, but it would be a good idea to have the planning board behind it. Um, and, you know, is, would you, uh, do you think we should ask for an audience with the planning board and the select board to say, this is something we're thinking about or, or you could just bring I, I, don't, I don't think we want to schedule a public forum without right yeah without looping people in uh, mm -hmm. as to what is going on mm -hmm. um, yeah I'm, I'm wondering if what we what we should spend our time is is coming up with a framework for what would be presented at the forum before we ask you know right I mean because that's the first question people are going to ask is well What's it going to look like? What are you going to talk about? What information? Who are going to be the presenters? All that kind of stuff. Yep, I think it's worth. Yes, it needs a little more, a little more thought, and as especially as we segue into summer, um, we're not going to get people's attention probably now until September. And that's actually, um, so speaking of that, the last item I had was just to talk about scheduling. Um, I thought what I would do um, after tonight's meeting uh, within the next few days is send out a poll to the committee um, and just ask who's available in July and August. Because um, we may not have an awful lot to, to meet or talk about. Um, probably doesn't make sense to have a July and an August meeting. Um, take a break one of the months. What do you guys think about that? Yeah, I think, but keeping it, you're just asking if people are available on the third Thursdays of July and August and if they want to meet then. Right. Um, I don't want to just throw, I would, I would suggest against just throwing it open as to when do you want to meet in July or August? Um, oh, yeah. No, I mean, sticking with the third Thursday schedule. Okay. I just find fully, usually this time of year, we run into, again, quorum issues where people are on vacation or, or whatever. Yep. So I'll send that survey out. Are we able to change the time from 6 o'clock to 6.30? Is that doable? Yeah, I've, I've got no issue with that. I just yeah, hate being late all the time. Yep. Yeah, no, that's fine. The... Uh, once upon a time, every board met at 7 p.m. <laughs> um, and the select board broke out of that, moved to 6. I was able to get the planning board to move to 6.30. Um, but uh, even on Zoom, if you're, uh, you know, those, we, we would, when we met at 7, we'd be going home at 11 sometimes. Oh, right? Lord. Wow. Um, and uh, admittedly, those were big, big things, like when we had Walmart coming oh. in. Uh, but um, it's uh, it seems to be easier that 6.30, we're usually done by 8. Um, but I think that, uh, yeah, certainly we could, it's easy enough to set it up. Um, Okay. okay. Yep. I made enough for that, Crystal. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, before we adjourn, I wanted okay. to ask: Was there an update on the uh, potential UMass studio that we talked about? You know, you could. Oh, you were meeting. sorry. The, yeah. Thank you, Justin. Um, yeah, Tony wasn't able to to meet tonight. Um, he said that he did reach out to both of the professors. He talked to one of them, but not. Don't think he talked to Steve. Um, and he would have an, 
he was hoping to talk to him tomorrow and he would send me an email update that I could send to the group. Okay. Okay. We have a new member of the committee. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, thanks. Thanks for the update. I just realized I hadn't heard anything on that. So glad to hear that's still moving. Yep. Okay. The only reason we don't have my cats here is that I fed them before the meeting. Oh, so they're, <laughs> they're resting in their glory now. Yeah. Well, resting that. Well, at least I'm not the only one trying to keep a third party out of the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay. He's come to visit today. Uh, I'm right. very happy to hear my grandson. Yeah. All right. So um, we have a motion to adjourn then? So moved. Yes. Second. Moved. Second. Yes. Third. All in favor? Aye. Aye.